All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, pray, and then we'll get into the Word tonight. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. We thank you, Father, always for your Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. We thank you, Father, he has free reign here tonight to minister your Word. And so, Father, we plan to receive from your Word and to receive the message that you have for us here tonight. We know, Father, that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing. And because of that, we believe that this will develop us and increase us into the things that we need in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17. We're very familiar with verse 18, Deuteronomy 8, 18. We're going to get there, but let's start with 17 first. Kind of sets the stage for what we're talking about here. The topic for the message this evening is uh, the power to get wealth. What does that mean? And we're going to talk about that. And uh, maybe, maybe look at it from a little different way than we have normally looked at it. Uh, Deuteronomy 8 verse 17 says, Thou shalt, or, uh, and thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand has gotten me this wealth. Now this speaks of a mindset that a lot of people have even today in what we would call our circles, the word of faith, charismatic circles, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's still a lot of people that have the attitude uh, that is best expressed by the secular expression, I'm a self-made man. You know, and what people may not realize when they say that is that it's coming from a position of pride. Now, there's, there's a good kind of pride and there's a bad kind of pride. The bad kind of pride, of course, is fairly obvious. That's the kind that Satan had when he said, I will exalt my throne above the Most High God. And that's the kind of pride that the Bible says goeth before a fall, <laughs> because that's exactly what happened. He had that, that kind of pride. He said, I'm going to exalt my throne above the throne of the Most High. I'm going to be like God. I'm going to do all these things. And then God said, no, you don't. And he was out of there, okay? And he was cast down uh, to the earth. And that kind of pride is definitely wrong, evil. There is another kind of pride we talk about, in the English word we use, pride, and that is a pride that you take in your work. That can be constructive. Because if you don't take pride in your work, if you don't believe that what you're doing is valuable and important, uh, then you won't do a good job. That can definitely aff affect your employment, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so you do want to take pride in that. Some people don't, have, don't take any pride at all in the way they dress or their appearance. They kind of let themselves go, as, the, as they say. And because of that, uh, it affects them. It affects their witness. So that kind of pride's okay. We just need to realize what kind of pride we're talking about there, all right? So, however, this is descriptive, this, this verse of scripture we've got here is descriptive of somebody that's gotten into the wrong kind of pride, which is, it is my power, my ability. The word power here is not power like muscles or like electricity. It's talking about ability. It's through my ability, it's through the might of my arm that's gotten me this wealth. And this is where the children of Israel were at. And this is speaking of them in Deuteronomy. They're, they're like, look at us, we just got out of Egypt, we have all, these, all the gold, we have all the belongings of the Egyptians, our shoes aren't even wearing out, look at us, we, are, we got it made. You know? And uh, they believed that it was through their own personal ability that they got their wealth. Now as believers, word of faith, Christians, we believe that it is God's will for us to prosper. We believe that we are to prosper, in fact. Matter of fact, let's go to 3 John verse 2. We'll come back to Deuteronomy 8, so hold that place. But uh, let's go to 3 John, uh, the second verse, because there's only one chapter in 3 John. 3 John verse 2, now notice he's talking to Christians here. He says, Beloved, I wish, and wish is such a 
I guess you'd call it a wimpy word. You know, it doesn't convey what he's really talking about here. The actual Greek word that's used here is talking about prayer. It's talking about desire. Uh, I wish, some translations even say, I desire above all things, or I want you above all things to have these two things manifested in your life. And notice what he says, above all things. Now, all things, if you think about it, all, as I have said before, is the biggest word in the Bible, A-double-L, all, that's all there is, there ain't no more. <laughs> you know, all things. So anything he could think of. Well, first of all, that tells me he's definitely talking to Christians because for folks that weren't born again, what I would most desire is that they get born again. Amen? So that goes without saying. If you're talking to somebody who's not born again, that's the first thing they need is to be born again. And receive Jesus Christ their Lord, confess Him as Lord, believe God raised Him from the dead, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10. Uh, 10, 8, 9, and 10. And so if they do that, then, all right, they're in the beloved. Okay? But now to the beloved, he says, I desire, I wish, I pray, above all things that I could desire, wish, and pray, that you may prosper. And the word prosper in the Greek is talking about financial prosperity. It's not talking about some spiritual strange stuff. It's talking about actual money, finances, prosper and be in health, and that's talking about physically, being in health in your body, even as thy soul prospereth. Now that is what we would call a qualifier. You're going to be in prosperity and you're going to be in health according or even as your soul prospers. What well, our soul is our mental realm, my will and emotions. Okay? That's the suke. And, uh, you know, we are a pneuma. We have a suke. We live in a soma. Talking about the Greek. The Greek words there. A pneuma is a spirit. So we're a spirit man. We have or possess our own mind, will, and emotions, which is the soulish realm, the, su the uh, suke. Then we live in a soma, which is this physical body that we look at in the mirror when we get up in the morning. And that's typically the way, unfortunately, we think about ourselves is, oh yeah, that bearded guy, you know, in the mirror, that's me. Well, no, that's just your body. You know, that's just your transportation. <laughs> it's no more me than my car is me. Okay? I, I walk around in this, and I drive around in my car, but it's not me. Okay? Not the real me. Now, yeah, okay, it's my body. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to disown it. <laughs> any more than I'd give away my car for no good reason, you know what I'm saying? But you really need to think of your body as your possession, just like you think of your mind as your possession. Don't let your mind rule you any more than you let your body rule you. If you let your mind rule you, you'll be emotionally driven. You'll be uh, driven by reason. Now, see, that's where a lot of people in the natural world because literally, I mean, think about it, their spirit is dead unto God. They are a spirit still, but it's a dead spirit. So they have no contact with spiritual things. So the only thing they really are dealing with is their soulish realm and their body, okay? So that soulish realm is what they reason with. It's what they have emotions with. So that's what drives them. So it's no wonder that people who are not born again are so, they go one of two ways, it seems like, a lot of times. They're either very rational, so they question everything, and oh, there really isn't a God, and science has all the answers, and all of that kind of stuff, or they're really emotionally driven, and they're up one day, down the next. They're driven by what they feel all the time. They're always talking about how they feel. I feel so bad. Well... <laughs> It doesn't matter how you feel in your soulish realm if you're a believer because you are a spirit. You have a mind which has feelings and has a will and has emotions, but it's your possession, so you should be controlling it and ruling over it. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit off track, but it's still good. I won't take any of it back. Uh, but the point of it is, Above all things that he could pray, desire, or want for you. And this is John the, the Elder. Okay, This verse of scripture was written by John. 
And as a matter of fact, it was written late in his life and ministry. He'd seen a lot. He had done a lot as an apostle. And he had seen the ministry of Jesus. And he had heard a lot of good teaching, not only from Jesus, but from other ministers of his day, as well as being used by the Holy Ghost to minister a whole lot himself. And having seen all of that, the elder John says, I desire above all things that you prosper and be in health. Now why? Well, he just wanted them to. Well, yeah. But there's a reason behind everything that God provides. He wants us to prosper in order to have the finances to do what we need to do here in the earth. He's not wanting to give you finances just to use on yourself. There's nothing wrong with using finances on yourself, particularly to provide for your family. The Bible says that somebody doesn't provide for their own family is worse than an infidel. Okay? So yeah, he wants you to provide for your family, no question. But that's not the only reason he provides finances. The main reason we have finances is spelled out in the scripture that says we have to, we earn our living, so to speak, we work at a job to have to give to those who need. In other words, you work for your seed. Okay? And when you get your seed through your work, you plant that seed by giving it, and then you live off the increase of the seed. Now that's getting into some of the mechanics of what we're talking about here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ease back off of that a bit and establish a few more points here. So he's saying, I desire that you prosper financially, I desire that you be in health physically as your soul prospers, and why? Because he wants us to reach the world with the gospel. You can only do that if you are healthy enough to get out and do it, or and or you have the finances to do it. You know, it's like I heard one minister say, if you can't go, send somebody. Well, the only way you're going to send somebody is financially, blessing them financially, giving to their ministry. Okay? But we ought to be doing it all. We ought to be ministering on the earth ourselves, where we work, our friends, our family, our surroundings, out in the store, wherever. We ought to be preaching the gospel personally to all that we meet. And if nothing else, we ought to be living a life in front of them that they can read. You know, some people say you are the only Bible some people will read. Uh, meaning, your life, not reading an actual book. So, either way, you're, you're here as a witness, as a representative, as a uh, minister of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says. So, that's why we are given physical health, and that's why we're given finances. Now, it also goes without saying that God is a loving Heavenly Father. He wants you to prosper, and He wants you to be in health because He loves you. Okay? I mean, you think about if you're a parent. If you're a parent, most parents that are sane. <laughs> we see some on TV that aren't. <laughs> and we hear about some of the news that aren't. But parents that are seriously have all their marbles, they want their child to do better than they did financially. They want their child to be in optimal health. They do not want them to see them in, in the hospital. They certainly don't want to put them there. Now unfortunately Christians through the years have been taught a whole bunch of crazy stupid doctrine through various churches that say God wants to make his people sick and God wants to make his people poor. The exact opposite of what this scripture says. Okay? Which ought to tell you where that's coming from. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, if Satan can keep the church poor, and if Satan can keep the church sick, what does that mean about preaching the gospel? It's not going to happen. So it is in his best interest for Christians to be sick and to be poor. So what do we see? Poor and sick Christians. Because they buy into this false teaching that that's what God wants. God likes it when Christians are sick because they're learning something. Well, it looks like eventually they learn whatever it is they're supposed to learn and get well, you know. But no, they go years and years and years. God's just teaching me something. Well, bless your heart. Learn whatever it is. 
But no, that's not really the truth at all. God doesn't have anything to do with making them sick. It's the devil. Now we know that from John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and kill and destroy. Well, that's good old King James. We can take all that King James out of it and say, Satan only comes for one reason. That's to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, however, alternatively, I'm paraphrasing a bit here, I have come that you might have life and have that life how? More abundantly. Well, abundance speaks of wealth and prosperity. Okay? So, again, we see... Basically, the battle lines are drawn here at John 10.10. 10. The battle lines are, Satan comes only for one reason, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. As Pastor has said many times, and I love this when he, when he talks about putting it in columns on a piece of paper, you write down what's stealing, killing, and destroying in your life, and over the top of it you put the devil. And then you write down all the things that are blessing and, and health and prosperity and abundant life, and that's the Lord. And it's so simple. I mean, you know, it's like Charles Capps says, you've got to hire somebody to help teach you the incorrect side of things. Matter of fact, I heard a minister of Word of Faith Radio recently, bless his heart. I'm going to tell off on him just a bit. I'm not going to say who it was, but it was one of our... Uh, you know, local ministers. And he said, he was talking about his pastor. He loves his pastor. He's talked about how wonderful his pastor was. And his pastor, he was on the show and he was a guest and he had a lot of good things to say and they were talking about healing and they were talking about blessing. It was good stuff. And so at the end, he was talking about his pastor's book. His pastor had written a book and he was making it available on his radio show. This guy who's in the church. And uh, the book was called The Schizophrenic God. And his, you know, the book was coming from the point of view of that Christians must think God's schizophrenic because it, they think he's blessing on the one hand and destroying on the other. And so that's schizophrenic. That's not God. That was the, the pastor's point. Like I said, he was doing a great job preaching the Word. And, uh, but this guy made the statement. He said, uh, my pastor, he has, he has an anointed ministry. He's doing great, so forth and so on. You need to go to his website, so forth and so on. He's really, boy, he's pumping him up. And then he says, you know, it's like Charles Cap says. He said, sometimes you have to hire people to help you misunderstand the Bible. Oh, no. And then he said, and my pastor will help you. <laughs> and I thought, no, 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 that's not what you meant. <laughs> Well, his heart was in the right place. I knew what he meant, but that's not what he said. <laughs> and I had to say, bless your heart, brother. I bet your pastor's out there listening going, no, no. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was funny. So I just had to tell off without saying who it was. <laughs> anyway, so the point is, we've had a lot of help through the years. You know what I mean? We've had a lot of preachers, not like his pastor who's teaching the, the truth, but we've had a lot of preachers teaching a lot of junk, and people have been buying into it. And it is a shame, because the body of Christ, sadly, is, is living in the results of that teaching. Which actually brings me to another point, and that is this. You are a product of what you hear taught. Okay? Now, that's whether or not you think it's affecting you or not. I've had a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians tell me. They, they've listened to my radio program for years. They came to my meetings. They would come to Bible studies that I taught. When I was pastoring, they would come to my church. And all the time, they'd be saying, Oh, man, Dr. Bill, I love your teaching. I love hearing your program. And I love hearing the Word of God. I said, oh, really? Where do you go to church? Oh, the first such and such. The Doubt and Unbelief Church down on the corner. And I'm like, why are you going there if you enjoy hearing the Word of Faith talk? Yeah. Well, you know, Dr. Bill, uh, I'm there as a mission yeah. to that church. I'm there to help them and minister to them. I said, let me tell you something. 
your heart's in the right place, but you're only hurting yourself. Because the people you fellowship with, that is what you take on. Okay? So if you are constantly fellowshipping with people who are telling you that God makes you sick to teach you something, doubt and unbelief, and the whole time you're sitting there going, no, 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 I don't believe that, no, I don't believe that, it's affecting you. It's dragging you down. And eventually you're going to find yourself saying, well, you know, maybe God does occasionally make me sick, you know. And before too long you'll just slide on down that creek bank and doubt and unbelief city. Okay, so you need, and I've said it before, where you go to church is a matter of life and death. Literally, physically, <laughs> life and death. There are people who are dying today and have family that have died because of where they went to church. Yeah. It's not just something that you say, well, you know, that church down on the corner, it's closest to my house and it's just easier to go there. You know, I had to drive as far, I don't have to spend as much gas. I tell you what. I drive 35 minutes one way coming here, 35 minutes the other way going back home. And it's all interstate, so I mean, it's a long ways. And it burns some gas, but you know what? I don't notice it one lick. Because what I get here keeps the gas in the car. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Amen. Keeps me blessed financially. So where you go to church is a key to this. Yes. Because what you hear Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And I tell you what, that works on the other side. Fear comes by hearing the Word of the devil. Doubt comes by hearing the Word of the devil. And you say what you will, this junk that's being taught, this false doctrine, whether it's God makes you sick, or God wants you poor, or greasy grace, or whatever, any false doctrine, it, it originates from the devil. It, it originates from demonic forces that are pushing that doctrine. And so if that's the case, you know it can't help to hear it. So fear, doubt, unbelief, that comes from hearing the word of the devil. And if you give in to that by listening to it, you will be affected by it. So what we want to do is we want to hear the word. Now going back to that scripture, God desires that we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. Even as is a statement of equivalence. It's like an equal sign. If you have a number two and a plus and a two and an equal and a four. Two plus two equals four. That's because if I have two apples and I put it beside two other apples, I end up with four apples. It just works. And it works every time. You can give me two oranges, two oranges, I have four oranges works every time. It's reliable. It's what's called a law. Well, this is a spiritual law. And the way it works is, as your soul prospers, what does that mean, as your soul prospers? It means as your mind is renewed to the Word of God. As you renew your mind to the Word of God, you are going to prosper or increase or have blessing in the area of health. If you're hearing health scriptures, see? or wealth or prosperity as you're hearing those scriptures. So again, the seed you plant is what you grow as your harvest. If I sow to doubt and unbelief, I'm going to reap doubt and unbelief. If I sow to healing, I'm going to reap healing. If I had a sickness or disease in my body that I needed to fight, as wonderful as it would be to, to listen to prosperity scriptures being read to me, that's really not what I need right then. What I need right then is, is scriptures on healing. I need to be feeding my spirit and planting seeds of healing in order to have the healing manifest in my body. Now, no matter what, as a believer, you are the healed. Why? Because Jesus bore my sicknesses. He carried my diseases. By his stripes I was or have been. I'm already healed. So I am the healed. What Satan's trying to do is make me sick. Okay? I'm the healed. And John 10.10 10 said that Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Well, if he's coming to kill, steal, and destroy, that means he's coming to try to make me sick. Well, I'm the healed. He's trying to make me sick. Yeah, but I'm the healed. Yeah, but he's trying to make me sick. 
So what I need to do is I need to hear Scripture concerning healing to build it into my spirit and build me up. Why? Because 3 John 2 is a spiritual law that says as my soul, my mind, is uh, transformed, is renewed, is metamorphosized, as my mind is renewed to the Word of God, then I'm going to prosper in that area, which is healing. Okay? So again, if I'm facing sickness and disease, I want to listen to Scripture concerning healing. If I'm facing financial issues, I need to listen to Scripture concerning finances. Now, Larry Hutton has been here before and has taught, and he has a CD where he reads Scriptures. That's all it is, is just Scriptures. But it's out of different translations. And he has a piano, you know, in the background, beautiful piano music playing. But he has at least two that I know of. He may have more now, but I have two of them. One is called Wealth Food, yeah. and one is called Health Food. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it is. It's the Word of God. Remember, the Word of God is the children's bread. It's food. And it's food for our spirit. Now, we exercise our spirit by operating in faith and by speaking in other tongues. That's what exercises our spirit. But we receive sustenance or fuel for our spirit by hearing the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Now, let's just take a minute, and I'm, I'm getting back to Deuteronomy 8. There's still there's this little marker up here in my head saying, Deuteronomy 8, get back there. Okay, <laughs> I will. But the first thing is, we need to look at Romans 10. Romans 10, verse 8. Brother Larry said, you didn't give me that scripture earlier. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You know, my computer is, is dead here, so I can't look at that, but it's still in my spirit, so it just keeps coming out. Romans 10, verse 8. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. Now, this is Paul obviously writing to the Romans, so he preached the word of faith. But he said that Barnabas and Peter and... All the folks that were with him preached the word of faith. Seems like they had a whole bunch of people there preaching the word of faith. <laughs> so, what saith it? The word is nigh unto thee. It's in your mouth. The word is in your mouth. Well, first you've got to hear it. Then it gets in your mouth because whatever's in your heart in abundance comes out of your mouth. Comes out of your mouth because it's in your heart in abundance. That is the word of faith which we preach. That... Next verse, that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or the Greek actually says Jesus as your Lord, receive him and confess him as Lord, and believe in that heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be sozoed. Okay, the word sozo here in the Greek means saved, delivered, protected, made whole, healed, Spirit, soul, body, financially, and socially. Those five areas cover your whole life. Spirit, soul, body, financially, socially. Five areas. Now I challenge you to think of anything that isn't covered by one of those five areas. Yeah. Amen? And this word, sozo, covers your, every aspect of your life. Your spiritual life, well that's even heaven. That's even after we leave here. Your soulish realm, that's your mind, will, your emotions. Your physical body, including healing. Well, healing's part of that. Your social relationship with other people. And your financial dealings, or whether or not you are prosperous. Okay, all of those areas are covered by this word sozo. As a matter of fact, sozo, as a word, is a lot like the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom also, we think of shalom as meaning peace, and it does. But it means so much more than that. It is full of meaning. And that word means not only peace, it means wholeness, completeness, soundness. So when you wish uh, someone, you know, as the Jews would meet one another and, and, and they'd see one another, they'd say shalom. They're wishing them peace, soundness, wholeness, prosperity, wealth, all of those things in that one word, shalom. Now remember, 
we know that God our Father is Jehovah Shalom. That is, He is unto us not only peace, soundness, prosperity, wealth, healing. Well, of course, He has other redemptive names that reveals those aspects as well, you know, like Jehovah Jireh, our provider. That covers the wealth part as well. And then uh, uh, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. That covers the wholeness. But it, it's, to me, it's really amazing that that word shalom, it just covers so much. Well, the same way with this word sozo. It covers so much. So, if we confess, now, uh, here he's talking about primarily being born again, okay? I understand that. But there's more to being born again than just getting a ticket stamp and going to heaven. We know that. So, confess Jesus as your personal Lord. Give Him complete control of your life. Believe in your heart that God's raised Him from the dead. Then thou shalt be, shalt be. There's no doubt. There's no wondering. Am I? No. Shalt be. Okay. Save, deliver, heal, protect, and made whole spirit, soul, body, financially and socially delivered from all temporal evil. That's the meaning of the word. Now, why? Next verse. We'll explain that. The why of it. And that is, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto soteria in the Greek, which is a different form of the same word. Say, delivered, healed, protected, made whole, spirit, soul, body, financially, socially, delivered from all temporal evil. That all-encompassing word is just a different tense of it that to fit into this verse of Scripture, you know, and, and make it make sense in the Greek. So with the heart you believe under righteousness or right standing with God, your position with God is correct. With your mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, verse 17. Let's get down there. I had to give you all that to get to verse 17. And that is this. So then, faith cometh. You know, it's like the old saying, money cometh, that we know. Faith cometh. Well, how does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, it's interesting the way this phrase is used. The hearing and hearing is present tense continual. Think about that. Hearing and hearing. Notice it didn't say having heard. Now, I'll tell you what. I have heard the Word of Faith message. Woo, hallelujah. I have heard it. For Pert and I owned a 30-some-odd years, <laughs> okay? But my having heard it would not help me now because that's not how faith cometh. Mm. Now, if what it means is that 30 years ago when I first heard it, faith came, right? And when faith came, I got born again. When faith came and I heard the Word of God concerning the Word of Faith message, the power of words, the power of confession, all of those good things. Faith came and I heard it and I believed it and I operated on it. And guess what? I've been healed supernaturally. I've had financial miracles. I've had all those kinds of things. But if I quit hearing it, what's going to happen? No miracles. No healing. Why? Because I'm going to run out of food. Yeah. Right? Now, you know, I obviously don't look like I need any more food. <laughs> Just between you and me. But, again, but you know what? If I were to quit eating altogether, it would take some time, but eventually my body would shut down. I'd be a 98-pound scrawny guy that just fades away into nothing. If I quit eating entirely, okay? And if I quit drinking water, I tell you, in about a week's time, I would be dead. Because that's how, about how long you can go without any water at all. You, you will, your, your tissues will just dry up. And you'll cease to function physically. So you have to drink fluids. And you have to take in physical food in order to live physically. Well, it's the same thing is true with your spirit. The difference with the human spirit is this. It never completely shuts down. Your physical body, if you don't drink and you don't eat, will completely shut down. It will die. Okay? Your mind 
can shut down to where you won't think, you won't have any will, and your emotions are gone. It can shut down. Your spirit can't. Why? Because your spirit is a different kind of creation. God breathed the breath of life. That spirit comes from God directly. And God is eternal. And guess what? Our spirit's going to live eternally, either in heaven or in hell, but the eternal part is not in question. Okay? No matter what, your spirit will not shut down to the point that it ceases to exist. It just isn't going to happen. I know there's a lot of unbelievers out there that think, well, when I die, that's it. Well, you can say that, but guess what? You're going to wake up in hell. You know, oh, that's hard, Dr. Bill. Yeah, but it's the truth. And we need to be telling people truth. Now, we're not telling them that just to completely shock them and scare them. That, you know, that doesn't win people to the Lord. What wins people to the Lord is preaching the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that caused men to come to repentance according to the Word of God. So yeah, we ought to be telling them that God wants to bless them, God wants to help them. But we ought to be honest about the fact that if they stay in the state they're in, eventually they will die physically. And when they do, they are connected spiritually, supernaturally, to their father, the devil. It's not that God sends anybody to hell. He doesn't have to send anybody. They're already tethered to hell because they're tethered to their spiritual father, the devil. And Jesus made that very clear when he told the scribes and Pharisees, Ye are of your father, the devil. Now, they were religious people, but they were religious in the wrong way. Okay? They were not following the truth. They were following religious ideas. And religion, hate to say it, religion will kill you spiritually. So, matter of fact, the Word of God says your religion and your unbelief makes the Word of God a none effect. I mean, come on. So here's the thing. Kind of digressing here, but here's the thing. You have to have spiritual food. And the spiritual food you have to have is the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Hearing and hearing and hearing. That's present tense continual. So what do I need to do? I need to hear the Word continually. Well, that means Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Listen to Word of Faith Radio. I do that every day. Uh, studying the Word of God, hearing messages, going to meetings, whatever. All of those are excellent ways to hear the Word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word of God. And the Greek word there is akoe, A-K-O-E. More than the mere sense of hearing, it implies hearing, receiving, and understanding the teaching. See, a lot of people get the idea that all they got to do is just sit there like a knot on a log. Feed me, Pastor. I'm just going to sit here. Now, you got to make a conscious quality decision to receive from the Word of God. you got to pray and believe God and decide that Pastor's got a word for me that is exactly what I need to hear at exactly the time I need to hear it. And I am going to receive, I'm going to draw from that anointing, and I'm going to receive what I need, and it's going to be good food for my spirit to grow. And if I need healing, he's going to give me healing scriptures. If I need prosperity, he's going to give me prosperity scriptures. But you know what? If I know I've got a particular area of need, I'll eat in that area. Okay? Now, there's a lot of people, I'll give you a good example. There's a lot of people that have a, uh, a deficiency in a particular vitamin. Uh, matter of fact, in uh, uh, you know, the old sailing days, uh, the British had a problem with scurvy. Okay? It was a condition where they didn't get enough of a certain vitamin. And it turned, I think it was vitamin C, if I, if I remember correctly. They needed vitamin C, they weren't getting it. They couldn't get it at C. The only place you can get vitamin C most of the time is from a fruit, you know, like oranges or whatever. So they found that eating fruit gave you vitamin C, so they would, they would put fruit on the ship. And one of the fruit that they particularly carried that was easy to transport, the size and the, the ability to transport and so forth, was the lime. And so they would, they would eat the limes and they would suck on those limes and get that lime juice and it would get them vitamin C and it healed them from scurvy. 
So they were called Limeys. That's how they got the name Limeys. Because they ate the limes. Well, guess what? They had a need in their body for a particular food. And that's all a vitamin is, is a type of food. How did they do it? They ate the food they needed. Now, if they'd have eaten steak, steak's good, but it doesn't have a whole lot of vitamin C in it. Okay? It has other things. It has amino acids, has protein, has a lot of other things. Enzymes. All kinds of good stuff. But it wouldn't have helped them with the scurvy. They needed the lime or the orange juice or whatever that had vitamin C in it. So it's the same thing with us. If we need financial prosperity, we need to be listed in the financial prosperity scriptures. Now, let's finally go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. <laughs> I hadn't forgotten. It's out there. A little tickler is up here telling me, go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let's look at verse 18 now. We looked at verse 17, how they were saying to themselves, it's through my power and the power of my arm that I've gotten this wealth. But, he says, but, woo, but, that's a big word. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. See, they were busy remembering themselves and their efforts. No, we need to be remembering the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee the power to get wealth. Well, now wait a minute. It's not through my own ability. It's God giving me the power to get wealth. Hmm. Does that mean I don't need to do anything? No, doesn't mean that. It means it's God giving you the ability, the power, the strength to get wealth. Now the word wealth here is very interesting. It is the Hebrew word kahil. Kahil. And it means uh, resources. That could be financial. It could be uh, food. It could be something you need that in, that's in the physical realm. Uh, army, that's another definition here. But think about army. Protection. That means uh, uh, having the resources, again, the word resources, having the resources to defend the country. That comes from army. Wealth, that's pretty straightforward. That's the definition as it's translated here. The word translated wealth, meaning financial wealth, prosperity, goods and services that you purchase through that. And then it also means virtue, valor, and strength. Virtue, valor, and strength. That's what this word wealth means. So he's talking more about more than just money. Now here's the thing that the Lord began to deal with me about, about this whole issue of prosperity. And that's this. Well, I had to give you all that background. <laughs> to get to this point. And that's this. We look at prosperity most of the time as just money. I mean, you think about it. When we talk about prosperity preachers or we talk about the prosperity message, people think money, 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 money. But that's a very low level of prosperity. Really. And this is what the Lord showed me recently that really got my attention. Because Frankly, as a believer that believes the Word of Faith message, as a believer that believes in the message of prosperity, it's easy to look at yourself and say, but I'm not rich, Lord. You know, have you ever done that? Let well, just be honest. Well, you know, Lord, I'm not really rich. Now, I'm not poor, <laughs> but I'm not really rich. Well, that's really looking at it the wrong way. And really, some of the things pastor's been teaching us is what's helped me with this. Because if you just look at it as how much money I have in the bank, then you're not going to get a real sense of how prosperous you are. Okay? Now, and I'm not, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about, I want to say this right because I, I don't want it to come out wrong, sounding wrong, okay? It's easy to try to kind of cop out and say, well, you know, I'm prosperous, but because I have my health and I have my family, I'm prosperous. Well, yeah, that's true. 
But I'm not talking about that. You know, it's easy to say that and say, well, yeah, you know, uh, I'm prosperous, but I'm not really rich. Well, now, wait a minute. Again, we're looking at it from the wrong perspective. And this is what the Lord's been showing me here. Because we look at it as just money. The money I have in my pocket. Now, these days, we don't carry a lot of money around in our pocket. You know, we carry credit cards. We carry all kinds of electronic means. I mean, I can pay for stuff on the computer and not even use a credit card these days. I can use PayPal. She doesn't even use a credit card. It's money that's in an account and it gets transferred electronically and there's not even any credit card numbers involved. Okay, it just happens. So we're kind of, even today, we're kind of past the idea that it has to be physical money in our hand. What we're talking about is ability. What can I do with my resources? Now, the question you need to ask yourself is not how much money I have in my bank account, but what's my resources like? What can I draw upon? Okay? I know a lot of, let me give you an example of this, and, and maybe you'll see kind of where I'm coming from, because I think that's what I'm going to have to do to really get across what I've got in my spirit. I know a lot of people, particularly at work, they spend a ton of money, a ton of their paycheck on drugs, on devices to keep themselves healthy, you know, uh, operations, all kinds of stuff. Now, my personal health care bill for years now has been zero. You know, I don't go to the hospital. I don't have to have drugs. Now, if I were, and, 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 and let me say this in such a way that'll strike your thinking, may sound a little funny. If I were normal, <laughs> if I were a regular human, based on what I see from people like at work and what I see on television and what I hear about, a huge amount of my money that I earn would go toward medical expenses. Matter of fact, the whole thing with Obamacare is that everybody's like, well, how am I going to get my medical expenses paid? Well, if you don't have any, you know what I'm saying? You don't have to pay them. Now you say, well, yeah, but Dr. Bill, you have to, you know, you ever get your teeth worked on? Well, yeah, I've, I've had that happen. Matter of fact, if you check, I got some gold in here. <laughs> where I've had crowns, you know. But on the other hand, I got a whole bunch of gold in here. It got paid for, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and a lot of the time that when I had that work done, I didn't have insurance. I just paid it. That means I had resources. Now, where did those resources come from? Well, God gives me the ability to get wealth. Okay? Now, here's where I think a lot of Christians have missed it in the Word of Faith message. Is they're waiting for heaven to open miraculously and money pour down out of the sky. That's not what God intends. He never said that would happen. There's, as a matter of fact, if, if you believe that, I ask you to give me chapter and verse. Because there ought to be some chapter and verse that says, Thou shalt lay down upon thy couch and wait for heaven to open and money to pour out of the ceiling. <laughs> it's not in there. The book, of <laughs> the book of Imaginations, I like that. That's right. That's right. Or the book of, boy, wouldn't it be nice if? <laughs> No, but that's not how it works. How does it work? Give and it shall be given unto thee, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Oh, but Dr. Bill, I don't want anybody giving to me because that would make me look weak. Well, then you're cutting off your blessing. You're cutting off your financial income. Okay? Now, that's just one form. 
men shall give unto your bosom. But if you give, see the first you've got to satisfy the requirement, give. Which means you've got to give beyond the tithe before you give because you're not giving if you're just tithing. You know, just tithing, just tithing. <laughs> yeah, because the 10% is God's. That ain't yours. So you hadn't given anything. You just returned unto him what he has provided for you. Now, beyond that tithe, if I give, then I've got a leg to stand on, on Luke 6, uh, 38, that says, Give and it shall be given you again, pressed down, shake together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Now, I'm reading that wrong. Give and it shall be given unto you again, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom, for with the measure that you meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, in the proportion that you give is the proportion that you will receive. Ooh, do we have to have that last part of the verse in there? Well, guess what? It's in there. So if you're giving that squeaky little dime, you know, and you don't even want to give it, you just barely let go of it, well, that's the way it's going to come back to you. The squeaky little dime, and it's going to take a long time. Brother Copeland one time said... Lord, why is it that I pray and I believe for my needs to be met? And sure enough, you come through and you meet the need. But it's at the last minute, the final hour. And the Lord said, how are you giving? <laughs> and he said, what? How are you giving? He said, well, oh, I see it. I'm giving at the last hour. I'm waiting as long as I possibly can to give first my tithe and then my gifts. I'm giving kind of slowly and regretfully. I'm not a cheerful giver. I'm just kind of putting it in there. He said, well, that scripture is a spiritual law. It's going to come back to you exactly the way you gave it. If you give it regretfully, if you give it slowly, if you're slow to obey when I tell you to do something, you know, I mean, I hear pastors say something like, you know, we're going to take up an offering today for a new camera. I'm like, get out the checkbook. You know, I am ready to give. I'm ready to give, and I'm ready to give quickly. I want the check written, prayed over, and in the bucket. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Why? Because the quicker I respond is the quicker it's going to come in for me. That's a spiritual law. So... How are you giving? You see, you've got to examine. Because you know, you're saying, well, okay, I'm a tither, yeah. I'm a giver, yeah. But how? Are you excited about it? you looking forward to it? Now, here's another thing. I prayed about this one, whether I was even going to share this. But I'm going to figure out a way to do it, because I think it's a really, 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 really good example. Please understand. Please understand that I ain't bragging on myself any. It ain't me, okay? God gives me the power to get wealth in order that he may establish his covenant in the earth, okay? Not my ability, not me at all. But you know when Pastor handed out those envelopes with our giving for the year in it to the church, talking about to this church? He handed me that envelope. I didn't open up and look at it. I just said, well, praise the Lord. I took it and went to the car. And I'm out in the car. I think I was waiting for Blenda. You know, she was in here talking to Bonnie or something. and uh, I, Or whatever. I don't know. For whatever reason, I was sitting in the car waiting. And I opened up the envelope and I looked at it and went, oh, my goodness. You've got to be kidding. Wow. Now, what does that say? Well, wow, Brother Bill, you must have given a lot of money. No, that's not the point. The point is, I don't remember giving that much money. You know what I mean? I didn't sit down and say, you know, this year, this year I'm going to blow the doors off. Boy, are they going to look at me and go, whoo, look at that. He's the biggest giver in the church. I didn't do that. It was not my purpose, not my intent, not my desire. I just tithed and gave and tithed and gave and tithed and gave through the year. And I looked at this amount of money and went... Lord, I didn't make that much money. I mean, 
you know what I'm saying, the 10%. If I take this and make it 10% and figure out how much it's supposed to be the tithe on, I didn't make that much money. <laughs> and, and what he kind of shared with me is, yeah, you did. You tithed and gave. This came from you. It didn't come out of the sky. You know what I'm saying? Whatever that amount is, you look at it and you go, wow, how could I have given that much money? Because, I mean, I've, I'm living in a house and I got two cars that I make payments on and, you know, I buy computers and toys and big screen TVs and how am I able to do that? And the Lord said, it is me that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that I may establish my covenant in the earth. And I went, yeah. In other words, it's not through my ability and the power of my arm that's gotten me this wealth. <laughs> Duh! <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I realized this stuff's working. Now you say, boy, Dr. Bill, that must have been a lot of money. Oh, well, okay. I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a million dollars, all right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it was a whole lot more than I thought it was going to be because you can take your salary and you can figure 10% and you know kind of what that's going to be. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not the sharpest math whiz in the room, but I can do 10%. It's pretty easy to move a decimal point. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So I kind of expected it to be X. It was X times. And I was like, Lord, how? And here's the thing. He gave me the power to get wealth. Now, yes, I got a raise this year, but it was 2.8%. Praise the Lord for the 2.8%, you know. Yeah, I got a promotion this year, and I got a 5% raise there. But the 2.8% and the 5% didn't equate to the amount of money that was in the piece of paper. And so I'm still scratching my head going, oh, Lord, I'm missing something here. And basically what he told me is this, and this is what I really want to get across to you. Financial wealth isn't the amount of money I have in the bank, it's what I have resources to do. The resources that I had this past year allowed me to give to the church far beyond what I thought, to be honest, I had given. It was not only a tithe, it was more than a tithe. And I, again, please understand, I'm not saying that to lift me up at all. I didn't even plan it, you know what I'm saying? I mean, to me, this is the part that really got me. I didn't set out. I don't ever set out not to give, believe me. I, I, I want to be a giver. But I didn't set out to blow the doors off. You know what I'm saying? And so what I'm saying is something had to be working. It just plain had to be working. And I was like, well, I need to examine what prosperity really is because it's obviously not money that I'm yeah you know, get a picture in your mind of Scrooge McDuck you know what I'm saying the old cartoon he's counting his money and he's throwing it in the air and he's enjoying just the gold and the money in front of him that is a very this is what the Lord shared with me that is a very low level of prosperity having just gold sitting in front of you is a low level of prosperity having resources. Now here's probably the perfect example and the one that the Lord used to really get this across to me. Most of you know that I talk a whole lot about the SpeakFaith.tv project, the Roku channel. I was sitting back there on the next to the last row during prayer I'm praying and the Lord said to me supernaturally, Now I didn't hear it like somebody's whispering in my ear in the natural. It was in my spirit. But it came up in me so strong, I knew it was the Lord. And he said, it is time for a Word of Faith Roku channel. I said, well, Lord, that's great. Wow. 
That's really great. This is before Kenneth Copeland had his. It's before Rama had theirs. There was no Word of Faith Roku channel, period. I had looked through the whole channel store. It weren't there. <laughs> okay. And so he said, it is time for a Word of Faith Roku channel. I said, yeah, it really is. Wow, praise the Lord. Now, it did not occur to me, thou shalt go and build a Word of Faith Roku channel. Didn't occur to me. I'm in prayer. I'm saying, I got zero dollars in the bank, you know, to myself. And so I'm sitting there going, well, Lord, that's great. I can't do it. Ooh, he came down on me with, you know, both feet <laughs> in my spirit. I felt chastised. What do you mean you can't do it? I'm sorry. And then I thought, ooh, I know. I've got to be sneaky, tricky. <laughs> the Lord's going to use me somehow, some way, by some hook or crook. <laughs> He's going to use me to get a Word of Faith Roku channel. And I know just how to do it. I'll buy Pastor a Roku. I can do that. I got 49 bucks. So I'm going to buy Pastor a Roku. I'm going to get it in his house because I know that Kenneth Hagin, Pastor Hagin, is coming to his house to eat with him at his house. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy that Roku box. I'm going to set it up for Pastor. I'm going to get it all hooked up. And then I'm going to tell him, now, you show this to Pastor Hagin, and he'll start a Roku channel. And I'll have been used of the Lord to have a Word of Faith Roku channel. Boy, I was just so pleased. And I'm praying, and I'm rejoicing, and I'm glorifying God. Thank you, Lord, for using me. Hallelujah. Because I had me a plan. And I thought, surely this doth mean that this is the plan. So I said, okay. So I went and bought the Roku. I set it up, showed Pastor how to use it. He was excited. I told him, now, the only th remember, the only thing I ask is this year, you show this to Pastor Hagen. Pastor Hagen came to his house. He saw it. He went, whoa, this is cool. So then he starts Rayma Roku channel. And as a matter of fact, what's wonderful about that is when he goes off of his radio program, almost every day now on his radio program, he says, you can get us on the Roku, you know? And I'm like, yes, hallelujah. So I was just all excited, oh man, I, you know? And I'm thinking, wow, God used me and I didn't even have any money. Wow, isn't this great? But that's not what God was saying. He was saying it's time for a Word of Faith Roku channel. I said, but Lord, Brother Hagen's got a Word of Faith Roku channel now. He said, yeah, but it's not Word of Faith, meaning Word of Faith Ministries. My ministry, Roku channel. And when I realized that's what he meant, I was like, oh my goodness. Lord, I can't do that. I don't have the ability. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the finances to hire somebody to do it. Well, now I'm all kind of bent out of shape. I'm like sitting there going, what am I going to do? And I'm, I'm in a class in Atlanta, Georgia for work, and we had a break. And I'm on break, and I'm surfing the web. You know how you do when you're just sitting there kind of minding your own business. And just out of the blue, it comes to me, I wonder what it would take to actually build a Roku channel. So I do a little research. And here's this guy who builds Roku channels. And he said, if you need one, send me an email. Oh, well, praise the Lord, can't hurt. So I send an email. I said, hi there. I'm, I work with a church, and I got this ministry, and I'd love to have a Roku channel. What's involved? He sends me back an email that day. Me sitting in class, I just about jumped out of my seat. He said, well, I can have it built for you by this weekend, but you need to send me some artwork and stuff. I went, what? <laughs> I mean, he wasn't saying send me $2,000, $5,000, $10,000, whatever to build this thing. He said, I'll have it for you this weekend. I was like, Lord. He said, I told you it's time for a Word of Faith Roku channel. Now, here's the thing. I didn't have to pay any money. I didn't even have to learn anything. The guy just built it and sent it to me as a zip file. I unzipped it, put it on the Roku, and there it was. And I was like, but not only that, I had the code, and I sent back a few more emails. How's this work? How's that work? Before too long, I knew how to build it. I knew how to extend it. I knew how to add features to it. I knew how to build channels. 
And I went, wow. And the scripture, the Lord gives you the power or ability or resources to get wealth. He didn't have to give me the money to build the Roku channel. He just had to get me the information. He didn't have to give me the money to pay somebody to do it. He just had to create a divine connection with a guy who turned out to be a Christian who was interested in getting the word out. And I just said, here, you can do it through us. And bam. And now we've got Mac Hammond, Larry Hutton, Mark and Janet Brzee, Jerry Savelle, Ed Taylor, our pastor, my program, all on this Roku channel. Every week reaching thousands and thousands, well over now 3,000 households connected to the SpeakFaith.tv channel. It was totally, totally supernatural. He told me in prayer, he gave me the wisdom and the knowledge and the ability to do it, and we did it and did not spend a dime. Now tell me that's not prosperity. Who knows how much it would have cost to develop that thing? And I didn't have those kinds of resources, but I had other resources. I had other ability. Same thing with personal finances. You say, well, yeah, but Dr. Bill, you're a server engineer working in the local hospital. Yeah, that's true. But I didn't come out of my mother's womb with the ability to understand computers. You know what I'm saying? Matter of fact, back then, there weren't any computers. Okay? When I was growing up and I went to college, they were still punching paper cards. And I was taking courses like PL1 and, you know, working with stuff that was billions of dollars of hardware. You, there were no personal computers. You couldn't sit there with a laptop and do stuff like you can today. But I learned what I learned because God gave me the ability to get resources, mental education, background, knowledge, training, to the point today, okay, I'm making a pretty decent salary over at the hospital, but I couldn't have done it without the Lord giving me the resources, the wisdom, the education, the training, all the background. But He did that. I didn't do that. And I, I, it's a long story that I'm not going to go into for sake of time, but I'll tell you, I've shared parts of it. I, I, to this day, can't do math. Now, you can ask Belinda, you think I'm joking. I can't do math. I had a guy at work just this past week. I don't understand how you can't do math and you're into computers. It's because you don't need to know math to do the computers. The computer will do the math. All I got to do is logically process information to the point that I know how to get it into the computer and let the computer do the work. Okay? So I say all that to say this, it's not just personal ability. If it was just personal ability, then I could be like Deuteronomy 8, 17 that said, it's through my ability that I got this wealth. No, that's the wrong attitude. What I need to remember is the Lord thy God that gives me the ability to get wealth. Amen? Because he's the one that put me in this position. He's the one that trained me in computers. He's the one that taught me how to do what I do. Okay? So, whatever it is you do, he taught you how to do that. He gives you witty inventions and ideas in those areas. Areas that I don't know anything about. I think about Greg and his furniture stuff. Man, if I had to design a chair, I'd sit there and scratch my head for days on end. You know what I'm saying? I can sit in them. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how to design one, particularly one that somebody buy. But he does that because God's given him ability in that area. And he's taken that, that witty idea and invention and so forth, and it's prospering him. And whatever it is, you know, maybe the Lord gave you an idea to start a gas station. So you started a gas station and you're doing that. Great. Praise the Lord. Whatever it is. He gives you those ideas and those abilities. To get wealth. Why? To establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And I like what Charles Capp says, the law of double reference. And that is, he does it 
to establish his covenant, meaning, pre meaning preach the gospel. But he also does it because he promised us financial blessing and he establishes covenant to us. So it works both ways. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Man, I got a three week series. I'm trying to do it in one night, so I'll stop. Because <laughs> I could keep going. We didn't even get to 2 Corinthians 8 9, which talks about that Jesus became poor to make us rich. Philippians 4. 19 that says that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And on and on and on. There's a whole bunch of other scriptures. But my point is, get your eyes off the money and get your eyes onto the witty ideas and inventions. And the other thing I wanted to say real quick, and that's this. The scripture is real plain. If a man doesn't work, he ought not to eat. Amen. So this idea of sitting around on your couch and God's going to make me wealthy, that don't work. Yeah. I'm just going to sit here and behold the Lord and I'll be prosperous. No, you won't. You have to put your hand to something. Now, the, the scripture says that whatever we put our hand to will prosper. But if you don't put your hand to something, you ain't going to prosper. But God will give you the witty idea and invention to put your hand to. He'll give you the idea, oh, you know, we need a Word of Faith Roku channel. He'll give you ideas like, you know, we need to develop this kind of computer system, whatever. But he'll give you ideas that will bless you financially. So thinking of finances as money is a low understanding and level of prosperity. Thinking of it as resources that God's given you the ability to use properly, now you're getting into real Bible prosperity. And that doesn't mean that every Christian is going to be a multi trillionaire Don't have to be. Because my definition of prosperity means God's going to supply all my need, whatever it may be, according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus, when I need it. I don't need enough money to buy a jet because I don't have any call for a jet. Personally, you know what I'm saying? If I don't need one, I certainly don't need the finances for one. But if I needed one, I'd have one, even if I didn't have any money in my pocket. Why? Because I have resource. Supernatural, powerful God resources. Remember the Lord thy God. Okay? Not my ability, my hand, but the Lord thy God. That's where our prosperity comes from. Praise the Lord. Well, did you get anything out of this? Hallelujah. I've been getting a lot out of this that I've been meditating on because it's showing me that, that I don't have to be self-conscious just because I don't have a huge bank account. You know what I'm saying? Because my resources go way beyond finances, way beyond bank accounts and, and money that I can count. And then the Lord does something every once in a while that just surprises me, like that, that money receipt thing from the church. And I went, what? <laughs> because the thing is, it comes to us and through us, and we don't even pay attention. Yeah. Think about that. Now, I don't know if you like me and opened up that up and went, wow, look at all that I gave last year. Hopefully you looked at it and went, ooh, praise the Lord, look at all I gave last year. Not, oh my goodness, if I had that money, I could have done X. See, Christians do that. Nobody here at Faith and Victory Church, I know, but there are Christians that do that. Oh, man, if I didn't have to tithe, I tell you what, if you didn't tithe, you wouldn't have nothing. <laughs> but because we are tithers and because we are givers, whoo, we got everything at our command. We got resources. And that's what we need to concentrate on is that God can use us in all these areas and without having to have the huge bank accounts. Now, if he wants to give you a huge bank account, believe me, I am not against that. I am for it. More power to you. But I'm not limited by that bank account either. Amen? That's prosperity. All right.